I'll tell you this. It feels like comedians can't stop complaining about cancel culture. It's always people like Dave Chappelle going on about how these days you can't make a joke anymore. But is that really true? Today on the podcast, cancel culture has been around since the start of modern comedy, even if curmudgeons try to tell you otherwise. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. I think this would be maybe a good place to start. Hey, der, if you do anything wrong in your life, duh, and I find out about it, I'm going to try to take everything away from you. And I don't care what I find out. It could be today, tomorrow, 15, 20 years from now. If I find out, you're finished. Who, who's that? That's you. That's what the audience sounds like to me. Yeesh. That is comedian Dave Chappelle. That is from the 2019 comedy special Sticks and Stones. Although, he's got a brand new comedy special that just came out on Netflix last week. Maybe you watched it or read about it. I gotta tell you, it is safe to say, if you've not watched it, he's got the same stance. He's got the same stance on cancel culture and the way that he thinks about it. Dave has been criticized over the years for telling jokes at the expense of disabled people, about, about transgender people. And all of these things raise a bigger question. They raise these bigger questions around freedom of speech and expression and how different generations have objected to the entertainment that we watch. Comedian and comedy historian Cliff Nesteroff has a new book that takes a historical approach to unpacking all these questions. It's called Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars. I spoke with Cliff about his new book, and I started by asking him why these past few years have felt so divisive when it comes to what we watch. Here's what he had to say. Well, I think there's two things at play. One, social media has changed our interactions. It's also changed um, what we are presented with. What I mean is, in the past, let's say somebody complained about the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour in the hmm. late 1960s. There was no social media. So how did people express their grievance? They wrote a letter. They wrote a letter to the editor of TV yeah. Guide or Life Magazine or the local newspaper, or they wrote it directly to the comedians or the television network. And in those days, the phrase was letters to the editor. Mm. So if there were 100 letters of complaint about the Smothers Brothers sent to the local newspaper, they didn't publish 100 complaints. They published maybe one, maybe two. Right. Today, there is no editor. With Twitter, with social media, all 100 complaints are published uh, instantaneously. Mm. And so, in my opinion, this creates the illusion that people are more irrational than in the past, that people complain more today than they did in the past, whereas it really isn't a difference in humans. I think it is a difference in the technology, in the deliverance of those grievances. So I think it creates this feeling that um, people are oversensitive or that you can't joke about anything anymore. When in the past, people complained about all kinds of things that in today's, um, by today's standards would be completely innocuous. The Smothers mm. Brothers show, the Carol Burnett show, mm. uh, All in the Family, things that are now classics were objected to by many people back in the past. So I'm going to come back to that idea that technology is thinking is, is shaping the way that we think about um, cancel culture. But let's talk a little bit about the research that you did um, for the book. So in terms of thinking about showbiz and cancel culture and culture wars, how far back did your did your, did your research take you? Um, well, I started in the 1800s. I could have gone back even further <laughs> because wow. yeah. the idea of a cancel culture it starts, you know, with the inception of. Uh, <laughs> Of uh, of Canada, the United States, in terms mm. of colonizers uh, uh, outlawing the practices of indigenous peoples, uh, religious practices, ceremonies, languages, uh, all of these things were banned very early on. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, the Puritan era, um, there was a ban against what they called amusements, which today we would probably consider entertainment or showbiz. <laughs> but even uh, playing cards was considered an amusement and banned in many colonies. Um, so I could have gone back further, but I actually mm -hmm. went back to the 1830s, the 1840s, the start of the blackface minstrel uh, trend mm -hmm. and craze, and quoted from some people very early on who objected to the practice of blackface, um, Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist, I have a quote in the book, in the year 1848, he complained about blackface comedians 
referring to them as the filthy scum of white society. Mm. And we think about controversies in regards to racial depictions or ethnic depictions or racist depictions as being a relatively modern phenomenon. And here we have Frederick Douglass in the year 1848 complaining about such. I, I like this uh, example because um, there's, there's a real sense of like, oh, you're trying to complain about racism. That seems new. Comedians used to get away with all kinds of stuff, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And you're saying, no, actually, if you go back all the way to the 1800s, people complain about this stuff. They just didn't complain about it in the same volume and in the same sort of yes. like clarity. <laughs> People complained about these things in the 1980s. One distinction I want to make about the whole concept of the uh, so-called cancel culture is that people do get in trouble for things, but we should make a distinction between getting in trouble for something you say and do on stage and getting in trouble for behavior that occurs off stage. Right. And we have a tendency in the culture to conflate the two, hmm. to give an example of, oh, you can't joke about anything anymore. We then point to a comedian who was accused of uh, sexual assault off stage, they should have no uh, relation or correlation. It should be two completely separate considerations, but they tend to get lumped together and then used as evidence that you can't say anything anymore or that a comedian is being canceled. When the reality is we have different standards and uh, permissions for what people do on stage and what they do off stage. And if you're an insult comedian on stage, you can get away with a lot. But as soon as you step off stage, you can't start insulting people at the grocery store and expect to get a positive <laughs> reaction. So we have different standards depending on what is happening on stage and off, but we have a tendency to conflate the two. Hmm. So Cliff, it's worth noting that a young Cliff Nestroff had his own run-in with censorship. I want you to talk about that because that got you expelled from a high school in British Columbia. What <laughs> happened, dude? <laughs> well, I ran for school president in mm. rural British Columbia at my high school. Um, you would campaign for school president in the 11th grade. And then if you won, you would serve as school president in the 12th grade. Mm. Well, I won the election, but I never made it to serving <laughs> during the 12th grade. So I wrote this really salacious speech and I went through a list of all these salacious things on the first day. Uh, God said, let there be. Uh, water fountains in which the water tastes like blood, which it did, <laughs> with these, rusty, these rusty pipes. And so the kids laughed at that. But then as the speech went along, um, everything I said got more and more salacious. I said, uh, God said, let there be an English teacher who uh, was kicked out of a, another school for sexual harassment. And everybody went, ooh. And I said, oh, God said on the fourth day, let there be a drama teacher who once did softcore porn. And all the kids went, ooh, this is in front of the whole school, this this speech running for school president. All, all the kids knew the rumors. to gossip. Yeah. You know, I had a line in there about God creating an art teacher who huffs glue in the back room. <laughs> and I don't know that that was completely true. But man, did it ever get a huge roar from the audience. <laughs> and then by the end of the speech, I said, um, yeah. I said, you know, as school president, unlike my opponents, I make no promises except for one promise. That is... If elected school president, I will be the coolest school president Mount Sentinel has ever seen. And then I had an <laughs> operative in the uh, in the PA room and he hit play on a cassette tape and the theme from Shaft came on and I walked <laughs> off the stage <laughs> and the crowd was roaring. They're like, yeah, yeah, you said they have four Oh my God. I mean, first of all, I want to go back and like reinstate these votes because like that deserves it immediately. <laughs> But also, yeah, yeah. like an experience like that, like, like that has to shape your worldview a little bit about censorship, about comedy, about what it is that you do, you know, with a platform. So how do you think that experience shaped what we're talking about right now? Well, I never thought of it as censorship. I knew that you're not allowed to say the <laughs> F word in your Fair enough. school assembly, yeah. you know, yeah. which is why I did it, right? So that sort of uh, not different than a lot of comedians who get in trouble for saying things today. Uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, they know that what they're going to say is going to get some sort of reaction that isn't just laughter. It might be um, right. you know, hostility. And some comedians play with that. And some comedians that aren't that funny uh, will really play with it because a reaction of any kind is better than no reaction at all. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting big laughs, you can at least get oohs and ahs. Um, and then there's comedians who are funny who also play that game. 
who like to get the reaction and sort of play with the audience and, and say things that are taboo. So I knew the F word was not permissible. I knew that saying salacious things about the teachers would get a reaction. But for me, the whole purpose was not some sort of uh, free speech mantra or making a point. It was to get big laughs. Right. It wasn't even to get elected. I didn't care about being school president. I just wanted to do this performance that would get a huge reaction. And it did. It was like... It killed. Uh, I would bump into people years later and they'd be like, remember the speech? And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, I remember, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love the thing that you just said there also about the idea of expecting and knowing that there's going to be a consequence because like, that's maybe something that we don't talk about enough when it comes to comedy. So I, I do want to represent some of this worldview in their own words. So I want to take some time to focus in that world in particular because you've heard some recent comics who have been outspoken about how sensitive you know, and outraged mm -hmm. and quote-unquote woke they feel their audiences compared to the past. I, I want to play you a clip of Seinfeld talking to Seth Meyers about this. Comedy is, I do think, is the you know supposed to push the line, push towards the lines of the medium. There are more people now who will let you know if they think you went over the line than ever before. Don't I know? It. I mean, you have to yeah. feel the same way about comedy. Yeah, but they keep moving the lines in for no reason. Right. I I, I do this joke about um, uh, the way people need to have the, justify their cell phone. I need to have it with me because people are so important. All right. You know, I said, well, they don't seem very important the way you scroll through them like a gay French king. <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> you, I could imagine a time where people say, well, that's offensive to suggest that a gay person moves their hands in, in a flourishing motion <laughs> and you now need to apologize. I mean, th there's a creepy PC thing out there that really bothers me. When you hear that, Cliff, what do you, what do you make of what Seinfeld just said there? Well, there's another clip from a few years later in which Jerry Seinfeld walks this back because this statement was seized upon by political people outside of comedy as evidence that you can't say anything anymore. And the, the, the talking mm. point was like, see, even Jerry Seinfeld thinks <laughs> things have gone too far. Interesting. Well, there's, there's a couple of things at, at play here. One is that Jerry Seinfeld, believe it or not, is a 70-year-old man right now. In what? Fact, he might be slightly older. Doesn't yeah. look like it. No. But consider the age of the average college audience. It's 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds. They generally, um, this it was true in the late 60s when college campuses were trying to book people like Bob Hope. Mm. Uh, a 70-year-old comedian more often than not, is going to be rejected by a 19-year-old, 20-year-old audience. They want to hear uh, comedians that uh, reflect their point of view, their demographic that they can relate to. So in the late 60s, people like Bob Hope and George Jessel were not popular acts on college campuses, although mm. they were still popular elsewhere in the culture with older people. College campuses, the students in the late 60s, they wanted to hear George Carlin. They wanted to hear Robert Klein. They wanted to hear the young comedians of that era who reflected their point of view. I think it's not that different today. I think that young people on a college campus generally prefer comedians that they can relate to that are going to be talking uh, in a way that they can relate to. And it's somebody like Jerry Seinfeld or any comedian of that age group is going to have a slightly tougher time. That does not mean that there aren't new sensitivities or new taboos in our modern culture. There mm -hmm. are. Most of those uh, new taboos or newer taboos fall into the category of either bigotry, slurs, or the perception of bigotry or the interpretation of something as a slur. Mm -hmm. Maybe these things are bigoted, maybe they're not, but that is sort of how they are perceived. And so there's a whole list of slurs that you may have heard on a stand-up stage in the 1990s with frequency that today would cause far greater controversy and would not necessarily be permitted, um, you know, for broadcast or um, would not just be uh, plainly accepted. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and this is Commotion. On today's podcast, comedian and comedy historian Cliff Nesteroff. He's got a new book out. It is called Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you why um, I find your book comforting. 
which is the idea that like none of this is new. We've sort of gone through a lot of cycles of this. What might be uncomfortable to admit is like the fact that um, the power of the collective to express disapproval is much more amplified, right? Like if you're if a comedian sort of steps outside of those taboos, they're going to hear about it more directly from a lot of people. They those people also might also like have the power to I don't know tweet Ted Sarandos of Netflix and say you gotta cancel this person's contract. Could that explain the concerns that comedians? are having right now yes i mean there's several different uh things at play here hmm. um in the 1980s eddie murphy andrew dice clay and sam kinnison at different uh periods were protested mostly by um, gay rights groups and sometimes uh aids um uh aids research advocates hmm. uh claiming that they were spreading ignorance or homophobia and there were pickets at many different gigs, Minneapolis, uh, mm. Miami, uh, Seattle, several different places where they performed throughout their careers between 1985 and 1991. They were subjected to protests. Most people don't remember that. Um, like you say, there was no social media in those days, so it felt uh, more isolated. Yeah. And today things feel uh, more concentrated. But, you know, the one thing that I think is different is – Boycott campaigns and protest campaigns are not as effective yeah. when lodged against a company like Netflix because Netflix doesn't have commercials. Yeah. It doesn't have advertisers. But I do also want to point out when that Dave Chappelle controversy happened and some Netflix employees uh, protested, the way it was framed was that Dave Chappelle was the sort of champion of free speech yeah. and that this protest movement was uh, uh, anti-speech. Yeah. But – seemed obvious to me that both, regardless of your point of view, uh, were practicing free expression. Dave right. Chappelle practicing free, free expression, and then people protesting him also practicing free expression. So rather than free expression versus censorship, you had free expression versus free expression. Mm. But it was uh, never really framed that way in the press. I certainly, uh, well, it wasn't framed that way by Dave Chappelle either, right? Like someone like Dave Chappelle sort of expresses, I think, a vantage point of being like, they're out to get me. They, these specific people are sort of like trying to shut me down. I'm not going to be shut down. That is a posture that he takes to all of this. He certainly, I don't think, characterizes it as free expression. I think I've heard him in several specials say, characterize it as something a little bit more sinister than that. Yeah. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and this show is called Commotion. On today's podcast, comedian and, and comedy historian Cliff Nesteroff. We're talking about his new book, Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars, that is out right now. Uh, Cliff, when we talk about comedians who are funny and they follow their instincts, I think like one of my favorites on this one is Bo Burnham. And I want you to hear another perspective from him. This is Bo Burnham talking. I've had jokes that I thought were, were taken as the very thing they were satirizing. You know, like, uh, we're seen as racist when it was meant to be the exact opposite of that. But, you know, that's that's part of the gamble of what performing is. It's meant to be interpreted in, in any way it can. And uh, But no comedians are being, you know, thrown in jail. They're getting, like, lit up on Twitter maybe a few times. They go through, you know... And that's wrong and maybe bad sometimes. But again, this is from people who have had their opinions heard relentlessly, hours every night, all the time. And then a blogger gets up and expresses their opinion in a blog, and it's like, what? I mean, I just don't, I don't, I don't understand it. It makes, it makes, no, I, I, how do you not understand that the audience has the same impulse that you do? Uh, that's comedian Bo Burnham. He's chiming in on the whole conversation about cancel culture as it pertains to comedy. Cliff, when you hear that, what, what do you make of it? What do you make of uh, Bo Burnham's perspective on this? Yeah, I think that's uh, generally true. And again, like, I, I don't think that a funny person um, needs to second guess themselves too much. You'll find out right away. Long before the idea of cancel culture, mm. it was always the audience that decided for you whether you were funny or not. And it wasn't <laughs> a verbal right. opinion that was formulated. It was like an automatic. They laughed or they didn't laugh, mm. you know. And if they didn't laugh, what did that mean? Did that mean they were did that mean they were too sensitive or too stupid? Well, maybe. But a lot of the time it meant that what you had devised just didn't work and you had to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way to make it work or try something different you know mm -hmm. as, as comics you adjust your act for the audience for the venue for the circumstance and uh, over the course of time you get better and better at it mm -hmm. and sometimes it is the audience's fault but just as often it's your own fault you know 
And so things are not different now. Comedians should continue to follow their comic instincts and not mm. second guess themselves. Now, some people, they're going to be provocative for the sake of provocative and, and intentionally incite the audience. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know what my point is, but I feel like things are not as different today as they were when I started to do stand up in the late 1990s, mm -hmm. despite the fact there are taboos on certain slurs. And yes, sometimes when you parody or satirize bigotry, uh, it could be misinterpreted as furthering bigotry because maybe you used a slur in the satirization of people that use slurs or whatever. It is possible that misinterpretation happens. Yeah. But, uh, you know, again, if, as an artist, if you follow your instincts and you're talented, you should succeed more often than not. Um, you know, what I like about this is that, like, you will not let us have a moral panic in peace, right? Like, the idea that, like, people are out there being like, ah, comedy sucks and everyone is really worried about the future of comedy. And here comes along your book and you're like, ah, all of this, none of it is new. All, we've just kind of recycling the panics of the 80s, which re recycled the panics of the 50s, which recycled the panics all the way to the 1800s. Um, thank well, you. The, Con the, continue. The panic, the panics of the past yeah. all look hilarious to us today. The panic right. over <laughs> they do. seems funny. Yeah. The panic over the Beatles seems funny. The panic over the Simpsons and Beavis and Butthead seems funny. But when it's a modern panic... <laughs> Everybody takes it so seriously at the time. Oh, drag queens, they're coming for your children. The drag queens are coming. You know, it's like, no, it, if it doesn't sound ridiculous right now, which it should. Yeah. Uh, 20, 30 years from now, when you look back on it, it definitely will sound just as absurd as the hysteria over Elvis, the Beatles or the Simpsons. And I think that's an important point. Do not be deceived by fire and brimstone just because it's not coming from the mouth of a fiery preacher, mm. you know. It's still fire and brimstone when it comes from the mouth of somebody who's secular. You know, it doesn't suddenly make it more true or more rational. It's still like uh, chicken little, in my opinion. And when you look again at the access we have to stuff, thanks to the Internet, cable TV, satellite radio, there's far more freedom of expression in mm. all genres than there was in the past. Uh, compare Cardi B's hit song to the hysteria over two live crew in the late eighties compare um, the fact that I can walk around town and see side boob everywhere mm -hmm. I go mm -hmm. compare that with the Janet Jackson nipple controversy of 2004. Like sure. things have changed. Things are more permissible today. The main objections tend to be over that, which is perceived as bigotry. So contrary to the idea that you can't say anything anymore, um, you can say more things today. It's just in the realm of bigotry or perceptions of bigotry, there are some new taboos. Cliff, that is a perfect place to leave it. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. A lot to think about there. That was my conversation with comedy historian and pride of British Columbia, Cliff Nesteroff. Cliff's new book is called Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars, and that is out right now. And that is it for the podcast today. Listen, remember, you can listen to any episode of the show anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. If you got a couple minutes, we would really appreciate it if you'd head over to Instagram and follow us. We are at Commotion CBC. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Listen, I'm going to be here tomorrow. So if you're going to be here, I would love to see you then.